Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Welcome back. You're going to love today's show because today's show is all about your favorite subject, which is you. It's not just about your favorite subject, which is you. It's about your favorite subject, which is you upgrading everything. And we're going to go through um, a suggested list of things to consider. Now, this is right out of our best-selling book, Harris Rules. And we're going to give you along the way in today's show some examples of coaching clients who have followed these uh, suggestions for upgrading everything and the results that have come um, in their lives and their obviously their business and their personal lives. And it's really important. I'm going to start out by giving you guys this little thought. The most important thing in your life is obviously we can, you know, Julie and I are tactical and practical, so we're not going to get into, you know, the spiritual realm as it were, but it's definitely your environment because where you live, who you surround yourself with, the things you listen to, the books you read, all of it, it matters more than you can possibly imagine. Your environment absolutely shapes the person that you're going to be and your family is going to be and your generations of folks after that are going to be. Julie and I are originally from Columbus, Ohio, and we've lived in different places. And let me tell you, when we go back to Columbus, Ohio, it is strange how everything is exactly the same in a good way, not necessarily a bad way, but how it does really remind me how important an environment matters because I definitely feel like it felt when I was a kid living in Columbus, but Essentially, Julie and I radically changed because we changed our environment. We moved. We were consciously aware of the thoughts we were having, the people we surrounded ourselves with, the books we were reading, all of it. There's, I think, been no more important time in the last probably 20 years to be hyper-conscious of conscious or conscientious? Yeah, both. Could be both. Either mm -hmm. of your environment. What do you think about that? I agree. And as you were talking, I was thinking your environment can mean many things. Certainly, you know, your house, your office, the town you live in, all of that, and how you look at yourself, but also how other people perceive you. So some of this gets down to making a great first impression. It's harder to make a great first impression if you lack confidence because maybe, you know, you don't quite feel that great about yourself for one reason or another. Let but me give you a rule. Wherever you're resisting is where your growth needs to be. You should write that down. So when Julie and I are going through our suggestion, a suggested list of things you should consider upgrading, I want you to be very uh, considerate of how you're feeling. What's the internal dialogue when Julie and I say something? Uh, are you resisting it? Are you going like, oh, I'm not going to do that, or I'm as good as I'm going to get, or anything like that? Because on the other side, especially where there's a great deal of resistance, on the other side of that is where you're going to find the most, um, the most substantial uh, growth and the most important growth many times that you've been resisting. So just allow yourself when you face down those uh, uh, emotions of, you know, not wanting to necessarily internalize what we're suggesting, don't give yourself, don't empower that. So if Julie says, for example, if one of our points is maybe you want to, you know, upgrade your wardrobe or something like that, something, you know, that you can all do. And you're going through the process of thinking, I like my clothes. My clothes are great. My clothes are from what, 1972? <laughs> and you wonder why people treat you like your, you know, your best days are behind you, things like that. So be very, very careful allowing yourself to believe that your best days are behind you. And the way you will know that is ask yourself the question as you're going through what our suggestions, where are you resisting? Where do you feel the internal dialogue trying to essentially drown out the message that we're hoping to share with all of you? Well put. So we've all heard the famous and true saying, you never get a second chance at a first impression. Many studies have shown that the average person forms a lasting impression about another person after between just two seconds and two minutes. So think of the last person you met. What was your first impression of them and why? What do you remember about that encounter? Was it positive, negative, or neutral? Do you recall what they do for a living, their full name, and if they have kids and where they live? If not, perhaps they failed to make a great first impression on you. But conversely, what would they say about you? Now, other studies show that most real estate clients use the first agent they meet. I would say 
the first agent they meet who is professional. Uh, well, yes. And that's definitely changing in a market like this. Cause, For sure. Yeah. I mean, but meet face to face. And that's one of the reasons this is an aside that open houses, if you're doing following our professional open house system, asking questions, being a professional, looking like a professional, when somebody walks in, chances are they will work with you. Uh, but if you're not, then your experience is going to vary dramatically and you're going to find yourself meeting with a lot of people that don't work with you. It's because you are doing the first things, not at the highest level. Things like the first impression, for yep, example. Exactly. So, yeah, that's right. So if your goal is to be the one that they work with, uh, I'm sure you'll agree that this is something to really curate. You mentioned open houses. It's a great place to practice this. And this is something about real estate that you can control. A lot of you feel like everything is out of control all of the time, but you can control your first impressions. Now, before you read your next points, let me set it up a little bit. So if we, all of us, all of us, <laughs> well, 12, 15,000 of you are listening right now. So let's decide we're all going to open up a pie shop. And we're going to name it after, uh, in honor of Bob, who we use as an example all the time on this podcast, whoever Bob is. And if Bob, you're listening, this is for you. So it's going to be Bob's Pie Shop. Now, what are we going to do to make Bob's Pie Shop successful? We're going to make the storefront beautiful. We're going to use a great logo. We're, of course, going to have beautiful pies. We're going to go out of our way to make it so Bob's Pie Shop is something you cannot walk or drive by. You must go in, even if you don't like pie. And what you're going to experience as you go through this experience that we've curated for you are a lot of what we call moments of truth. We, Julie and I got that from Howard Brenton. Now, if you have a retail location and you're selling a retail product, I mean, think of all the retail stores at the mall. How much money and time do you think they went into exploring the psychology of every experience that somebody has? Because they know every single touch point is a moment of truth. Maybe, for example, you decide you need to buy some underwear. And you're going to uh, go to the mall and you're going to go to, you know, you got an ad or saw something on Facebook and Instagram that triggered you to want to go shop for underwear at the at the mall. And I mean, I think, frankly, I'm thinking of Victoria's Secret right now because Julie and I used to sell real estate to a lot of Victoria's Secret executives. Yes. And frankly, we learned a lot. Marguerite Garvey, who yep. does listen to the podcast, mm -hmm. uh, she was an executive at um, Victoria's Secret. She now sells real estate in Florida. Yes. And she was the one that gave us a really great education about all the moments of truth that occur when you're interacting with a Victoria's Secret store. So why am I telling you all this? Well, so let's define a moment of truth in definition of that. A moment of truth is a split second judgment that the public makes about you. Or in the case of your underwear example, the split second judgment you make about something you may or may want, not want to buy or a store you may or may not want to go into, a salesperson that you may or may not want to deal with. So are you friendly, trustworthy, professional, and knowledgeable? Or are you just somebody they're going to casually meet and forget the next second? Here's, so here's the challenge we all have. We are operating virtually for the most part. We don't have storefronts. We don't have uh, opportunities to, you know, essentially win their attention as they're walking past us in the mall. That does not exist in real estate, especially in the day and age where, uh, frankly, all the best brokers and teams are going virtual and joining Julie and I at EXP Realty. And you guys get the point. It's COVID basically killed off the need for real estate offices, I think, for final. Fi yes. It's, you know, consumer, I have a point about that coming up, by the way. Consumers are not going to want to go into real estate offices. They didn't want to go in the first place. And now it's even going to be more of a challenge to get them in there. That on a side, you don't have the opportunity for the most part to really uh, define your moments of truth in a retail setting. So your moments of truth come in all the little micro points that a lot of us take for granted. For example, your signs. For example, how quickly you answer the phone. What your you know website looks like. What your social present looks like. All of these things matter more than you possibly could imagine. Because when you think about how you go about choosing somebody to hire as your to provide a service for your or your product, you are looking for reasons not to want to do business with them when you're searching. You're looking for reasons to disqualify them. So if you're walking down a, a mall and you're walking past a store and they've done a great job in the window and it looks like it's a friendly, nice place, you're going to go in. The, your, your same decision-making apparatus doesn't exist. You're not thinking of, okay, I like the store. It looks like a cool place, but I'm looking for reasons why I'm not going to go in. No, your butt's going in that store. It's a first impression thing. It's the exact opposite happens in a virtual business. In a virtual business, for the most part, people will spend a lot more time trying to disqualify you before they choose to do business with you. So you cannot give them an excuse not to do business with you because you essentially were lazy on one of these points. That's right. And we are, I'm glad that you talked about both online and offline 
offline because we need to make, well, this is an interactive podcast. <laughs> okay. So we're going to ask you to make a list of all of your potential points of contact or first impressions with the public. Or, okay, so online, for example, Tim mentioned some of these, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, your website, your online real estate profiles on Zillow, Realtor.com, your broker's website, your digital newsletter, marketing campaigns, and any other apps you use. So make a list and make sure you look at your credit card statement to capture any profiles <laughs> maybe you forgot about, right? So that's online. We're going to drill down on that in a second. And the second category is offline. You mentioned some of that with the real estate sign and things like that. Your voicemail message, your sign, your home brochures, your car, your handshake, your directional signs, and of course, how you dress. And it's worth noting, if you should go and do an anonymous search for yourself, and there's uh, you know anonymous web browsers you can use, or frankly, if you use Chrome all day and you're on Apple, use Safari, because Safari, if you've never used Safari before, it won't have essentially be cookied and all the rest of it. And then do go to Google and then do a search for your name, you know, put a realtor after the end of it, a real estate agent, whatever. And then you're going to see how they're generally speaking, the people in your marketplace are going to find you. But what is interesting is the search results for you are going to be different on desktop than on mobile. And also, depending on where you are in the country, let alone where you are in the world, for the sake of what you're trying to accomplish, the very least you want to do is do a search on desktop and then do a search on mobile and to see if you like what's coming up. And I'll also add to this, Julie, the other place where you can get killer, we're kind of talking about SEO here, but not a lot, is going to be having a YouTube channel. A YouTube channel, those YouTube channels, especially on mobile, are getting indexed. In other words, the search results are giving preference to, on mobile, not on desktop, are giving preference to YouTube videos. So just remember all that. All you really need is a profile. It looks professional. And advanced coaching here, which all of you hopefully should know by now, is you definitely want to have all your profiles look the same. You don't want to have different, like a different picture on Instagram than there is over on your YouTube channel. Have all the branding be consistent all the way across because that creates obviously a, a sense that, well, this is a professional. This is not somebody, I mean, Julie and I, we laugh sometimes because occasionally one of you guys will send us a message and you're having some sort of problem and we'll then try to solve your problem. And then before we spend any time or call you or whatever to try to help you, we're going to do a little bit of homework on you. We're going to do a little bit of Googling. And from doing that, oh, we yes. have found some of the most hilarious things online. And Julie's got so a lot of great examples. <laughs> do you want me to do those now? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So again, we're talking about all of your online presence. I had somebody I was in one of you that I was researching and I did exactly what you're talking about, you know, did a little search because I like to know who I'm talking to before I call them back or <laughs> call them in the first place. And first of all, the email address was I sell red worms at AOL.com. That's maybe my favorite email address. So what's the deal with this person? Go ahead. And there was another one that was alien abduction. Oh yeah. Well, that was another favorite alien abduction. And this was not just one post. This was not just Facebook. This was kind of like all kinds of random alien websites and Facebook profile where this gal was talking all, I mean, very, um, we're not I judging. Believable. I mean, if you were, it was very believable. Okay. If, you, if you're selling red worms and you're been abducted by an alien, God bless you. It's That's all fine. fine. It's right. Not judging. It's your jam. But the moral but is that what you want to lead with. Right. Cause remember what we said, consumers are looking for reasons to disqualify you. So you're going to have to be really sensitive to that. And also I'll give you another little thing here. Do not complain about anything online ever, Do, ever because that follows you. And if people see that you are complaining about some restaurant on Yelp or whatever, they will immediately disqualify you. I don't know why the human brain works the way it does, but just remember that people are not looking for reasons to choose you. They're looking, looking for reasons to, ex to essentially make it so they don't have to choose you. Again, yeah. unlike normal retail. That's true. The other mistake that I see is either uh, agents not separating their business profiles and personal profiles and I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing. I have other coaching clients that, that do that well. But if your personal profile is radically different than who you want to be seen as, as a professional, maybe you had a past life doing something else. Maybe you have some kind of interesting hobby that might, you know, take somebody down a rabbit hole. You just have to be careful with that. And same goes with politics. Same goes Definitely. with really all these types of these bugaboos. That you're, you're not going to win. You're not going to win. You're going to, you know... Guys, just use common sense. You're a professional. If you are choosing a dentist to fix a tooth 
and you wanted to, you know, you're new in town, you don't have a, no one gave you a referral, so you have to do some homework. You're going to find a whole bunch of dentists that are local to you that can fix your tooth, and you know as well as I do, you're going to exclude the ones that aren't in alignment with your religion, your, you know, if you sure. find somebody, you guys get it. Even subconsciously people do that. Of course they do, because we're all trying to protect ourselves. It makes sense. It does. I mean, you, that's the reason that people judge so quickly. It's not all the things that we've been told. It's what it is. It's the hu it's part of biology. We've all been designed to look for reasons to determine quickly if it's friend or foe. Sure. That's right? the reason people yeah. wave. You wave. That The reason that people do that is because they're showing the person they're waving at that they don't have a weapon in their hand. Little known fact. Okay. And it is interesting, though. Okay. So we're talking about online first. Ask yourself. You've made your list of all of your online uh, presence, um, you know, the variety of those. And you're going to polish up your profiles, your first impressions, your moments of truth. First question to put that through is, what are you trying to accomplish with each profile? Are you trying to attract buyers, sellers? Are you trying to make realtor connections? What is the point of what you're doing? That's going to help you polish it. The temptation is, I'm working on my brand. Okay, that's fine. But what is the, what is the mission of your brand? right? You're working on how you want uh, the world to perceive you. How do you want the world to perceive you? And the easy button is fabulously successful in the rest of it. But what we'll suggest to you, so when working on your brand, when you're doing posting, especially on social, gear it towards attracting sellers. Yes, the buyers will come with. Right. Okay, point number two, what does your profile look like you're looking for? Are you a fisherman or are you a realtor in the case <laughs> of Mr. Redworms? Are you an investor or are you a broker? Are you both? Do you have any specialties? Are your previous employment profiles more prevalent than your real estate profile? Are you somebody that's trying to break into luxury, but all of your profile pictures are ripped jeans and flip-flops? Yeah, exactly. Check out your LinkedIn profile. Look at your LinkedIn job uh, history. If you're showing that you basically go from one thing to the next too frequently, um, older folks aren't going to like that. They're going to think you don't commit and they're not going to want to do business with you. Just remember, people are looking for reasons to choose not to do business with you. Well put. All right, number three. Do you monitor your different assets online or did you set it and forget it? Is the information someone sees when they Google you still accurate across all of your profiles? Are you still using a headshot from 2003? It's okay to eliminate the old accounts that you're not even using anyway. Fewer but better impressions are okay. Would you agree with that? Definitely. And, and again, you can't like, and we're not, this isn't a, uh, uh, you know, a podcast on social media. We've done those before. We talk about that a lot inside Premier Coaching. This is moments of truth. But really, at the end of the day, if we're going to talk about social media for a second, really, you can only maybe focus on two or three, let's call them channels. And the ones that are going to get you the most traction are the ones that you're actually going to want to use. That's the answer. Tim, should I start a podcast? Should I be using YouTube? Should I be doing a blog? Should I be doing Instagram or TikTok or all the rest of it? The answer is do what you'll actually do. And for most of you, it's going to be imagery because it's easiest to do. That's going to be YouTube or that's going to be Instagram or things like that. You, but when you choose what your mediums are going to be, you then you definitely want to drill down and own that space completely and do it the highest level you can. You can learn how to do all of it. If you don't want to learn how to set up your Instagram uh, or if you don't want to learn how to set up a YouTube page, you can find billions of people out there that'll do it for you. Go to Fiverr with two Vs, F-I-V-V-E-R or whatever, and you will find so many people from all over the world that will do a brilliant job for like 50 bucks to set up all that, set up all your social profiles for you. So if you do that, and there's again, a lot of people out there that'll do that, search for social media manager and then hire somebody just to get all your channels set up or the ones that you actually will invest in. That's really the, the bottom line. I mean, if you're doing a, a blog or a, a podcast, you might want to use Substack. Uh, so just there are differences. So the visual meet social media platforms, your Instagram and your YouTubes, they're going to generally attract mostly buyers and they're going to attract, generally speaking, mostly lower end buyers. Your upper end, um, frankly, um, the demographic research will show that people that listen to podcasts, you guys, generally speaking, are a little bit older, uh, a little bit better educated, a little bit wealthier. Mm -hmm. So when you're deciding what, like versus TikTok, I mean, all this should, you guys should realize what I'm saying just by, you know, thinking it through yourself. But so before you choose where you're going to plant your flag on what social media platforms, make sure your goal is a match to what their demographics are. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I think that's an excellent point because it's not always in alignment. Maybe all, you've got this thing in your head, I need to be doing more videos. 
And that's, that's all you know. Well, consider who your audience is. Consider what you're trying to accomplish and see if it's in alignment. What if you won't do videos, uh, don't be telling your, the world you're going to do a bunch of YouTubes. But it, here's, a, here's a hack code for that. Everyone can do Instagram. Instagram is super simple, super short videos. And you can take those short videos from Instagram and you can have those live over on your YouTube channel. And you don't have to, like, if you go to Julie and I's Instagram, you're going to see on our short videos or even on YouTube, you're going to see these short videos that have the, topo the ty ty what's the term, um, typography? Yeah. Over at, you, there's software, there's an app that Julie and I got. And if you guys want to know what it is, ask me on Instagram that does all that for us. So those little short videos that are essentially YouTube shorts and whatnot, there's an app that I think costs 50 bucks per year that is going and putting all those words and doing all those little graphics and all the little, you know, the all things. that Mickey Mouse, all yeah. the things. And that's how cheap it is. That's how hard it is. You all can do it. No more excuses. All right. Very good. So this is our last online point. Then we're going to talk. We're going to bridge into other things. IRL. Okay. Number four. Do you have <laughs> any unfinished profiles? Shadow pictures or blank descriptions look like you didn't follow through or maybe aren't even in the business anymore. So you want to delete those, start over, or just step away from them. Oh, I will tell you the funniest search I did what? because I did this two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not making this up. A gal in Florida. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think I told you about it. Okay, it turns out that basically she's making most of her money from only OnlyFans. Oh no. Okay. So and she used her real name. Yeah. Well, what did you think about that? Um, well, I mean, honestly, I just had a normal call with her, but I knew what her problem was, is because people were searching for her online and the people that weren't interested in let's call it poor and light weren't gonna probably call her. That's right. Well, so I think that one of the points you're making is when you're surveying your own profiles, don't think like you. Think like you're a potential seller client who's searching you and what is their impression going to be? It's so easy, you know, especially in the realtor world, it's easy to get caught up in what we think is going on and what we want to be going on. It's the environment versus thing again. the impression. If your whole environment is basically of a certain age group and everyone around you thinks and acts the same, it's very easy to essentially get stuck in that bubble and believe that that's the world. But if you're saying, I want to sell luxury real estate and you're in Florida, as was the case, and she wanted to, what, why am I not getting more of these listings? I, and she wasn't without, you know, she had some skill set for real estate. I mean, she had some success sure. in the past, primarily working with buyers, but she wanted to become a listing agent. What's the price range you want to sell in? Where are these particular markets? Well, I knew all the markets. I knew all the price ranges because Julie and I have literally thousands of, uh, of our EXP group and coaching clients are in Florida. So I know that market really well. All our coach, all of our coaches do. And so I knew that she wasn't going to uh, break into this particular market and, and, you know, essentially attract that particular demographic unless she did essentially play the part. Sure. And Upgrade part of it, the profiles. And remember, if you're, again, I'm drilling down this too much. Hopefully I'm not offending anybody. But most of the cases when you're having, like Rochelle, who mm -hmm. worked for us when we sold real estate, right? Sure. She had a problem where she was uh, coming off not flirtatious, but a little bit too uh, not conservative enough. And she would run enough. off the married couples where the man and the woman, she was work, she was a buyer's agent for us, where the woman wouldn't want to work with Rochelle right. because she, Rochelle was just being a little bit too Rochelle and just being nice and sweet. And the ladies were, didn't think it was appropriate. And we got that direct feedback because sometimes those uh, buyers that she was working with were also our sellers. So we asked her to go to the mall <laughs> and upgrade everything. And she did. And then after that, she never had that problem again. She started dressing more conservatively, uh, wearing more conservative makeup. She wore glasses. She put her hair up. Exactly. Stuff like that. Now, Rochelle being Rochelle, it's, be you know, there's nothing wrong with her personality or her skill set. It's just that she was so outgoing that without the polish, she needed to upgrade it. So if you're in Florida and you are trying to upgrade to a certain market price and market range, you've got to understand that for the most part, the people who are going to be determining uh, whether they're going to work with you, if it's a married couple, a man and a woman, is going to be the woman. She's going to be the one that's going to be doing the searching, and she's going to be doing the one deciding who they're going to work with. And a lot of times, it's, that's just that's the filter. And if you are essentially showing up in on uh, you know for search with search results that aren't in alignment with the person she wants to work with because maybe five years ago when you were younger, it was fun to put up what some people might uh, would maybe jump to the conclusion would be slightly inappropriate pictures. You guys get it? So if you have anything out there that's like that, you need to purge it and you need to do it immediately because that stuff's going to follow you forever. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the default should be to be polished and professional 
and to be one notch above where maybe you think you should be. But try to be the person that uh, they were looking for. Yes. Don't tell yourself. It's narcissism to say, this is who I am. The world's, uh, the world's going to basically wrap Take around it my, or leave it. Wrap around my little finger. I'm yeah. going to bend reality to my personal you know, qualms. That isn't the way it works. you got to determine who your market is. And like, for example, going back to Victoria's Secret as an example, when we were talking to Marguerite, mm-hmm. they were very careful on the colors and the fonts and the this is and the other things. All the little details, the rugs, the lighting, the all of it. Now, you like it or not, maybe that's not an example that doesn't necessarily resonate with you. Move it over to Pottery Barn or maybe switch it over to, you know, Williams Sonoma. It doesn't matter. They all have spent a lot of time. If your first impression isn't a polished professional storefront, if it's something that where you've left sort of some legacy breadcrumbs online that you're not proud of, that's probably the reason why you're not getting called out in the first place. But it's fixable, isn't it? Heck yeah. You ha- But in some cases, you're going to have to, if it's, you know, unfortunately, some of that stuff is impossible to remove. I will give you guys this advanced coaching, those of you who are in, Yelp, uh, in um, EXP. Um, generally speaking, Yelp has become a place where a lot of agents struggle because a lot of people, it's too easy to go up there and put negative comments. Now, anonymously, this, right? Anonymously, right. Now, if you are an EXP agent, and I, I know this for a fact because we've helped EXP agents do this, and I think right now we're going to help them do the same thing. I would strongly suggest all agents not have a Yelp profile because, again, it only takes – I'm thinking of um, the coaching client we had in uh, California. I don't remember his name. Uh, Stacy uh, Val, Val – remember Stacy? Oh, um, what was oh, his last guys. name? Val News. No, Val News, something, something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, so he had that exact thing happen. He bought a house. Um, he helped the lady. Uh, I think if I'm getting all these detail, any of these details wrong, it doesn't really matter because the overarching story is – the neighbor didn't want this house to be rehabbed and put for sale. So this neighbor went on to Yelp and posted all kinds of crap that was completely not true about him because she was so pissed off that the construction workers and the tree was getting trimmed mm-hmm. and just all this crazy stuff. So he then had, he basically he hired me as his coach for a bit to help him clean all that crap up. And we made a plan and we cleaned up his profile and really where it ended up going is here's what actually had to happen. The lady had posted anonymously. He knew she did it. She was almost like bragging to his face that she basically knew she was trashing him online. So he went and he called, hired an attorney. The attorney then, there, here's the process to get crap removed from Yelp. Not making this up. You send a takedown notice to Yelp. Yelp's going to say, uh, this is, we're protected under some, I forget what it is, you know, um, carve out that social media platforms have when we think we're social media. So user created content is between you and the user. Then, so you then have to go out, find out who the internet service provider is that hosted that person's uh, email. And then you have to send a letter to them. An attorney has to then contact their legal department, spend money, determine who that person was that posted that. And then you have to threaten to sue them to get it taken down. That is an enormous amount of time and an enormous amount of money when, because that particular thing happened to poor Stacy, who is, by the way, a fantastic agent. Great guy. Why am I telling you this? If you have a choice, which all of you do, especially if you're working in a virtual real estate company, have your Yelp pro- – do not let Yelp put a profile on you because it's just going to attract – essentially the type of feedback that most likely is going to work against you. And of course, Yelp makes money from selling ways for you, selling to you ways for you to enhance your profile. Here's what I know. Yelp's terms of service only allow Yelp, this is the reason you can have it removed, only allows Yelp to put up Yelp profiles for businesses that have an actual physical location. So if you have an actual physical location, Yelp, it's in, within their terms of services. They can put up a profile on you. People can go up there. You've seen this happen to local restaurants and whatnot. The local restaurant didn't want a Yelp page. Yelp put it up there. And then all these people pile on and say, your, you know, your coffee's cold. And the next thing you know, this coffee shop now has to spend a bunch of money with Yelp to get their profile cleaned up. It's ridiculous. It's a racket, basically. It's a total racket. It's what Better Business Bureau, frankly, used to do. Yes. And don't they prioritize? Don't they have the Negative. worst stuff at the top on right. purpose? They do. Because that's what people click on and that's what people sure. read. This all goes back to your environment. So go and Google all of this if you want to explore this yourself. And if you're an attorney and I got some of the facts wrong, please do correct me. I'll correct it on the podcast. But there you go. So if you're in EXP Realty, since there are no physical locations, because it's a virtual real estate brokerage, do consider removing, uh, uh, letting Yelp know that you're with EXP. They know you're, uh, you know, there are no physical locations and tell them to remove your profile. Otherwise, you're going to be battling this into the future.
I bet you there's agents and there's certainly restaurants, you guys have heard about all this, yes. that have gone out of business because of exactly what I just told you. Well, so that was, I mean, if you take one thing and you've had, you've come across any negative reviews, that's a fantastic way to, you know, to deal with that. That's, you know, that's it's, so, it's, it's horrible because there's all these small businesses out there that don't know what I just said. I know. And, and they don't know how to basically build their way back from, you know, it could be very well a competitor that's trashing them online well, it on Yelp. it cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. It'll put you out of business. Yes. Because exactly. remember what we said, the first thing that most consumers do nowadays is they go and they search for crap about you online. It's that, a moment of truth. It's a moment of truth. So you're going to have to, in some cases, go back and triage some of the things that might exist in the past. And be very selective about it. And please don't let your ego dominate your thinking and saying, well, I am the way I am. People will do business with me or they won't do business with me. Well, then no one's going to do business with you. Maybe your mom, okay? So you got to think about who it is that you want to attract to your life. And chances are there are people that are going to be sellers that are maybe operating in a higher price range than your current like you know, realm. Maybe you're living in a house that's 400 and you want to sell houses that are a million. You're going to have to... Uh, essentially curate yourself so that you are what they're looking for. Exactly. So moments of truth, point number five. And we're not trying to freak you out. We're trying to help you out. So if that gave you a little bit of stress, Tim told you exactly what to do about it. Well, it makes honestly, Julie, that really makes me sad because after I've, I told this story in the podcast before mm -hmm. and I had, uh, I bet you over the years, we've had over a hundred people, agents mm -hmm. tell me of their stories of woe. Yeah. And some of them are just so nasty. Well, it's, we feel outraged on their behalf. We do. And because a lot of times, again, if you can post on a website that gets really high search results, not as much as it used to. I've noticed Google's now uh, pushing uh, Yelp reviews down. Uh, that you can trash your competitor and there's no real direct accountability to have it removed. That and it's very that should be illegal. It's inherently evil. There it's inherent. No it's unethical at the very least. Unethical. It's not just unethical for the agent to post some crap about their competitor anonymously. It's unethical for a website to be a lot, to be permitting that and then monetizing it. Hundred percent agree. All right, moving on to our next moment of truth. Some of these will go fairly quickly because they're easy to fix. All right, how does somebody reach you? That seems simple. Well, is your mobile number easy to find or is it just your broker's number and then they have to figure out your extension and how to hunt you down? Is your voicemail always full? What impression are you leaving with your methods of communication? I'll tell you the easiest way to fix this is to answer your phone. Well, furiously fast lead follow up, right? Yes. I mean, that's the key. If and, somebody lands in your voicemail, don't let them sit there forever. And don't, you guys, the days of being able to send all your sifting and sorting of leads through assistance are over. If you're doing it that way, you're losing massive amounts of business. I'm sorry, top producing agents that I just told all your competitors your greatest secret that you follow up on your own leads. <laughs> yes, there you go. It's a secret power. All right, moment of truth number six. Are you weird about being a sales professional? Do you talk about real estate all the time using up-to-date market information? You know, like we feed to you constantly nonstop on this podcast. Where are you posting and commenting that the public will see you and what will they think when they read what you wrote? So that, that assumes that you're actually talking about real estate all the time. Make sure that what you're saying and how you're saying it is appropriate. So you don't cover this very much, but, and I know this is just a smattering of the points, but really, you're also going to consider, I, we touched on this at the top, mm -hmm. but how you look that's matters. That's point number eight. Okay, point number eight. Okay, well, then I'm not going to step on your that's, point. That's okay. No worries. Okay, uh, moment of truth number seven. When you have virtual meetings, this is when I added after COVID, when you have virtual meetings on Zoom or Google Meet, what does your virtual office look like? What is your virtual look? Is your cat walking across your desk spilling your coffee on your keyboard? Are the kids playing in the background? Are you actually still wearing that same hoodie you wore for weeks during COVID? I'll tell you something funny. Um, mm -hmm. So you guys will hopefully laugh at this. Plastic surgeons, as a result of COVID and everyone finally seeing how yeah, goofy they funny. look because they're doing tons of Zooms, the plastic surgery business went through the roof. They called it the Zoom boom. Well, exactly, the Zoom boom. One of our uh, neighbors, that's how I know. He's a plastic surgeon. And he said, because of Zoom, because everyone's on, you know, Zooms constantly looking at themselves, they were finding all the flaws and all that shit got fixed. Exactly. Especially <laughs> when you have the lights on and you have the halo and all those it's things. like, whoa. Whoa. Better fix that, right? Okay. Point number eight. When somebody meets you IRL in person in real life, what is your first impression? Do you have a strong handshake, professional attire, good haircut, makeup, nails, glasses, and other things that make for first impressions? Don't look like you're fitting somebody into your schedule and they're inconveniencing you out of your nap time. 
dress and act the part of the person that you wish to be treated as. That's the easiest way to make a lasting impression. Those points that Julie just said, especially how you, uh, how you dress. And the rule that we tell all of our coaching clients who are sharing with all of you guys, future coaching clients, is you want to dress not three stages above your, your crowd. So for example, if you're going to a, you know, a, a gathering this evening in a neighborhood and it, you're, you, everyone's going to be wearing flip-flops and shorts and ruffled up t-shirts and scruffy looking this and scruffy looking that, you don't show up that way. Oh, Tim, I want to fit in. No, you want to leave an impression. Okay, fitting in where you show up looking like they show up, that's going to do nothing other than basically let them think that you've been sitting around, you know, eating Cheetos all day. Mm-hmm. So what you do is you show up dressing a collared shirt, a nice pair of pants, a belt on, if you're a guy or a gal, it doesn't matter, and you dress up like you just came from a closing. Julie, tell them how you mm-hmm. used to do that. So ju- I'll set it up for you. Sure. So Ju- Julie's play, she's a, you know, she'll say semi-professional, but she's a professional, was a, re- she's a retired professional orchestra Uh, member. She played flute and piccolo. Yes. Okay. And so typically, you know, you guys think of a musician like that just when you see at concerts, but before the concert, there's a whole lot of rehearsals. And typically rehearsals happen after work. Typically people, other musicians, sometimes they would show up, you know, dressing nicely, but by and large, they'd go home and put on their sweatpants, put on a pair of jeans. You know, it's casual. They're not at work anymore. But I always made sure any rehearsal I was going to, I made an effort to look a notch or two nicer. Why? Because it was very easy for all the time. And we did so many transactions with my uh, music center of influence. By our fourth year, it was the single greatest consistent source of business from us was Julie's center of influence from her music sphere. Yes. And I'll tell you, here's what I didn't do. Hey, Tim, how's it going? When do you plan on moving? No, of course not. No. Instead, what happened was my musician colleagues would ask, gosh, you always look so nice. What do you do? Okay, so that is an, a door opening to have the Ford script talking about real estate. I almost always said, I just came from a closing. I just came from a showing. I just came from talking with clients. Oh, you're in real estate? It made it so easy. I almost called it, uh, it's like reverse prospecting, basically. And then all you have to do is not be weird about being in real estate, not be weird about asking questions. What are you most interested in? Who do you know who could use my help buying or selling real estate? It made it so easy. And because, and this is the reason this is a, gives you an unfair advantage. This is a center of influence and past client idea. But if because you're already like them, this is the reason going to Orange Theory works and doing all these other things we coach you guys to do. Because you already have things that are that are of interest to them. You share a lot. You know, you live in the same community. You have, you know, in Julie's example, you're uh, obviously in an orchestra. You have walked lives, a similar life path as they have. Of course, they're going to choose you to be the real estate agent over somebody that sends them postcards. You guys well, get the that difference? That was an advantage because, you know, once you were in with one, you were in with everyone. I'll give you one quick twist on this, right from uh, one of my elite coaching calls with John Solomon in the panhandle of Florida. Okay. So he was telling, we were talking about uh, building up his center of influence, going on more things to build that on purpose. And he, he was telling me about his calendar. He said, one of the things that he does is he takes his daughter to a coffee shop on Fridays after school. This is like their special time together. She gets something he, you know, sometimes they just are social. Sometimes he's on his laptop. He wears his branded uh, brokerage shirt, like a nice, I don't know if it's a polar or a nice t-shirt, but it's clear that he's in real estate. Okay. Last time he did that, he had, he stood up to, he said he's standing up to stretch his legs. He's friends with your client. No, no, Paul, I know. Paul, I know right? exactly okay. who Okay. So he was, and Paul was there as well. And they're like, oh, cool. oh I've got to stretch. I've been on the laptop for a while. Okay. Stands up and on his back is his branded brokerage. Okay. Lady comes over and says, oh, you must be in real estate. Introduces herself. He's, he introduces herself. He says, yes. Um, gosh, you know, it's nice to meet you. You know, easy conversation. And then she immediately fire hoses him with, I've got this house down the way. I really hate this house. I've got to get rid of it. Here's my story. I moved from the Midwest in the middle of COVID. I wasn't able to see it. I had to write an offer. I had to be competitive. I closed on it. I've had it for a year, but I really don't like it. I want to sell it. Can you help me? It was an expired that was just happening. And now he's got an appointment. Why? Because he looked nice enough. He was not weird about talking about real estate. And he had something that showed that he was in real estate. Because his moment of truth, his storefront was how he looked. Yes. His moment of truth was his ability to have a lucid conversation about real estate. His moment of truth was showing interest in Julie's obviously as coach. So she's then coaching him what to say and how to say it. You guys have to do the same thing. And it even expands from there. It's your sign. It's the car you drive. 
Again, we talked a lot about online stuff. All of this stuff matters. It's all in the book too. It, yes, and you can get our book, Harris Rules. But it's also very simple and oftentimes fun. And I'll, you know, you uh, yes, we're giving you permission to go shopping. <laughs> That's right. You can blame us for that. Yes, exactly. But if there's you, so many moments of truth. You know, we only talked about you know I- intertwined in the points for more points, but. I think we talked about probably 15 different things that you can have an impact on immediately, some of them online, some of them offline. This is something to work on and to perfect. It is a point of difference. It is a competitive advantage, or it's not if you don't take it seriously. You combine this with knowing what to say and how to say it and following a professional approach that you guys learn in Premier Coaching, you're pretty much unstoppable. Well, that's that's what I was thinking about, John, because it wasn't just the one moment of truth. He looked the part. He spoke the part. He was a salesperson. He asked good questions, and he closed for the appointment. That's at least five moments of truth <laughs> exactly. in probably less than, I don't know, maybe less than five minutes. Thank you for keeping this the number one list to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. We have over 2,000 past podcasts over on YouTube um, and over on Instagram. I'm sorry, over on iTunes and all the rest of it. So if you want more Tim and Julie, if you want more real estate training, definitely find it on all all of our past podcasts. Our information is timely to this market and the last market as well. But our greatest strengths as real estate coaches come in a market like this. So if you're needlessly struggling in this market because you're not adapting fast enough to the new rules of this uh, new market, you found the right real estate coaches. Now take the next natural step and become Premier Coaching students. There is a easy, quick link to join in the show description below. Have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. Hello, thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right, and don't forget to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're gonna love that one.